We're going to start defining our constraint clusters and we'll begin with manually defining some sections. The reason I often start with manually defining sections like this is because based on the animation, I often have a pretty good idea of where some of those large clustered together sections should be. In this particular case, there's a section right by where his hand first impacts the building that I want to remain clustered together as he drags his hand across it. You'll see that in this simulation, it looks like he's really kind of grabbing that chunk of the building and dragging that away as his hand moves downward. And I'll define one clustered section for that. And another section I want to have good artistic control over is this section at the end here, where he has his hand pressed up against the building and this is one of the things that I think makes the simulation most interesting because when he pulls his hand away, it's like he kind of tore that section off of that building and it's really just a delayed activation in the RBD sim, but it adds quite a lot. And because we really want to art direct the shape of this section that stays together behind his hand, I'm going to manually define that area as well. When we were setting up that passive static section, I mentioned that we don't want our constraint clusters attached to that area. So before we start setting up those manual sections, I'm going to split out the non-passive areas. So we'll connect that passive section output, call that split non-passive, and in the group we'll just type in passive and invert that selection so that this outputs everything except for the passive area. And as we saw in our animation, one of those manually placed areas for the left hand and the others for the right. So I'll just set up two separate nulls for those different sections. I'll call one left hand section and we'll make a right hand section as well. Now at the moment, we don't have our creature displayed, so in order to line up these passive sections, we'll have to look at his animation. So turn on Show All Objects, and then we'll scrub around to find a good frame where his hand looks like it's grabbing onto the building. Looks like maybe around frame 104 is pretty good. Doesn't have to be very exact. And then you can zoom in and start grouping your proxies with some spheres. So just drop in a group sop and we'll call this group manual. And we can just set the group name to manual as well. As usual, when we do this sort of thing, we'll turn off the base group, switch the type to points, turn on bounding regions, and we'll connect our left hand to that. And we'll start by using a bounding object which will switch to volume in a moment, and you will see why. And then if you place a sphere in your scene and connect that to your group and just display that group, you can see that color preview of your group in here, which really helps us to you know, see the shape of our selected cluster. You can maybe turn on the transform controls and move this around to your liking. And you might find that you have a hard time art directing the exact shape you want just with that one sphere. In this particular case, I might want to add a couple more spheres to shape this a bit more accurately. So here I've added in a few more spheres to shape this area more to my liking, but if we template our spheres and zoom in on our group, you can see that our grouping doesn't look like it's being grouped accurately. And that's because we have a whole bunch of overlapping spheres here. And when we group based on those spheres, when they're all overlapping like that, this bounding object can get a little bit mixed up. So in this sort of case, I like to convert that to VDBs with a VDB from Polygon SOP. And that grouping based on bounding object does seem to work with the VDB representation of those spheres, but since that is an SDF volume, I still tend to switch the group to a bounding volume instead. And now with that selection defined, we can use a blast node to isolate just that grouped area. I'll call this 
isolate manual chunk. And then in that group parameter, I'll just type in manual and flip this to delete non-selected. So you can see we just have that manual chunk defined. This is helpful so we can see exactly the shape of that hero section. Now one of the nice things about this technique is that your group doesn't have to be completely accurate and you can go in and select any pieces that you might want to remove from that cluster group. So I could perhaps turn on our primitive selection based on the name attribute and just select some piece that I don't want to be part of that cluster and just delete that. And once you're fine tuning the shape of this clustered area, we can just drop in a point wrangle and I'll call this manual clump because we're using this just to define a clump value on these pieces. Now the convention that I'm using for this shot is that all of my manual clumps start with a value of 10,001 and then all of the procedural clumps that we'll be generating later will have values lower than that in case we need to distinguish later between the manual versus procedural ones. So in this wrangle, I'll just type i at clump equals 10,001. Now if you want a preview of what it'll look like when this clump of our building is grabbed by the creature, we can create a little preview subnet for that here. You don't have to do it in a subnetwork, but I find that this is a little bit cleaner than confusing our whole overall constraint network with these sort of test animations. I'll just call this test grab anim. And if we dive inside here, we're going to object merge in the creature. So I'll just type in object merge. We'll grab that from the object level, assets monster, and then out monster. Because this might get confusing with our monster already displayed, I'm going to switch this to hide other objects so we just see the one in our section of the scene here. And let's go to some frame where we can isolate his hand a little bit better. It looks like this frame is pretty decent for isolating that area. So I'll start by selecting his skin geometry based on its path attribute, and then just drop in a split in the viewport to isolate that body mesh. And then we can unpack that section. And then if you turn off attribute based selection, we can try to select his hand, but that's not working yet because these are poly soups and we'll need to convert that to regular polygons in order to select it. So if you display the output of that convert node, then we can select just that hand area. You don't have to be very exact about it, but just delete that away and flip that to non-selected. And then if we display our input to this node, which should be our hand section of our building, we can pick a frame where the monster lines up with that. It is around 1004 or so. So let's template our hand and pick a good frame at which he's going to grab this. Maybe I'll do 1005. And we can just point deform these building pieces to his hand. So we'll drop in our point deform and we'll need to time freeze his hand at that rest frame. So I'll just drop in a time shift. Control shift click to break that expression and we'll connect our hand to that. And the time shift will go to the rest position of our point deform with the animated hand as the deformed points and the building into the first input. So if you display that, then you can see the building attached to his hand. Looks like we have some ghosted geometry in the viewport here, which is a bit of an annoying problem. So sometimes uh, that can go away if you just flip to the render view and then back to the scene view. Though it doesn't look like that's fixing it here. So sometimes you have to do a little bit more to get rid of that problem. Perhaps delete the scene view entirely and recreate it and then it should go away. Unfortunately, that gets rid of our display settings. I'll just bring back my dark background. So now it might be nice to preview what it looks like with this section of the building being grabbed by his hand. So if you wanna do that, then you can just drop in a switch node and connect our building geometry to that 
and the animated point deformed version into the second input. And then for our select input here, we'll use a conditional statement and just check to see if frame is greater than 1005. And now if we scrub with that switch selected, you can see that building that's static in place until he grabs it and pulls it away. And that gives us a pretty decent preview of what this section will look like once we animate this and have the pieces follow that animation in the sim. And as always in a subnet, I'll add in an output just in case we want to display this from the network above that subnet. Now for the right hand, we'll essentially do the same thing as we did for the left. So we can copy this whole section and paste it over for his right hand as well. I'm just going to hold Y and cut all of those lines connected to those spheres. And we'll connect that right hand section to that new manual groups up. And I'm going to delete this blast that was removing a piece of window frame since that name is not valid for this right hand section that we're defining. Now for his right hand section, I've decided that I want that section to release and become active at frame 1074. So I'll line up his animation at that frame and then set up those spheres to define that clump for the end of the shot. And then we'll go through that same process where we isolate just that one particular clump. And there are some pieces that are sticking into his hand here. So you could potentially delete those with some extra blast nodes like we did with the left hand section. And after blasting away that section inside his hand there, we can set up a new manual clump value for this end section here. And because we copy pasted from his left hand, you have to be careful that you change this value in this manual clump here. Left hand was 10,001, so we'll just set the right hand section to 10,002, and then we can just merge those together. Now, ultimately, we want these clump values to be applied to the rest of our proxy geometry. So we can create another line coming from our proxies here to transfer over those clump values, but we want the rest of our proxies to have some sort of default value for the clump. It'll be very helpful to know which pieces of the geometry haven't been clumped at all. So I'll create a point wrangle. I'll call this non-clumped value and type I at clump equals minus one. And then we'll connect this all the way up to our proxy geometry at the top. And with this default clump value specified on all of our proxy pieces, we can then copy over our manual clump values based on that matching name attribute. So drop in an attribute copy, connect our non-clumped value wrangle to that, and our manual clump pieces into the second input. I'll call this attribute copy manual clumps. And then the attribute that we want to copy over is just going to be that clump attribute and we'll match based on the name. And you'll notice that right now we're getting a warning because it's saying that's an invalid attribute for that match by attribute parameter. And this is one of those quirks of the attribute copy. We have to set the group type for both source and destination to primitives because that name is a primitive attribute. And then you'll see that warning goes away. And then if you want to verify that that's working properly, you can drop in a blast node and set the group to at clump equals minus one. Make sure that group type is set to points because clump is a point attribute. And you can see it looks like it's setting those clump values correctly on all of our proxies. And now that we have those manual clump values transferred over to the proxies, we can set up some procedural clump sections on this. But as I've mentioned before, we don't want to include that passive section in our clumped values. So we're just going to drop in another blast node here and delete the sections that we don't want to 
include in our procedural clumping. So I'll just delete this passive section. But we can see that the passive section is not being deleted and we're getting a warning that that group's not valid. And this is because we've connected our proxies directly to this. So if we go back up top and instead connect this to our with passive section null, then that warning will go away. And you can see it's correctly deleting that passive area now. And if you want, you can pick out some other sections that you don't want to receive these cluster clumps. And I decided that I don't want that infinitely strong clustering to happen where his arm first pushes into that building. So I'm just adding in this sphere here where I don't want any clustering applied. And we can do the same thing we've done before with our manual clump setup. But in this case, I'll call this group non-clumped and I'll convert this to VDB, connect that to our group SOP. I'll call this group non-clumped, set that group type to points, turn off the base group, turn on bounding regions, and turn on bounding volume. And then after selecting that section, just drop in another blast and delete that non-clumped section. And now with this area removed, we can go on to set up our procedural cluster sections.